Okay, starting again. Um, we, uh, you guys may know that we translate all of these into Spanish uh, simultaneous interpretation. And so um, this year we actually have um, six or seven Spanish speaking parent ambassadors. And so I want to make sure that that's available to them and any other Spanish speakers. So um, every once in a while we have a little um, technological glitch. All right, so I want to welcome you all back after two weeks um, in a holiday week. You know, I actually intended to send out a WhatsApp Monday email even on the holiday, and then I was just way too lazy, and I did not do that. And then I thought I could just send one out on Tuesday, and then I didn't do it because I was way too lazy. So I apologize for that. You all should have received a, um, a Monday update today. Um, and I want to call your attention to a couple of things on that at the outset here. Um, uh, one is that we have the um, Summer Institute registration available. I know that I've reported to you guys in the past that um, we would be starting this on June 8th, which would have been nice for some of you who are closing your programs by the 15th. Um, the original dates for the Summer Institute were the usual, which is at the end of June. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find any presenters who were willing to present the week of the 8th. It was unbelievably frustrating. So, um, so I invite you all to um, register, uh, uh, send to your staff or register yourself for the Summer Institute. We have um, nine great classes that we're doing over the two weeks of the 15th and the 22nd of June. So each of those are 10 hour courses, um, uh, not the super deep dive that we get at a summer institute, which is 20 hours, but we wanted to make sure that these were still things where um, there was going to be an opportunity to get to know some of the people in the class and to do a really much more deep dive on, um, on a subject than, than you can get in a 90 minute workshop or even a three hour workshop. So, um, so 10 hours, they go over the course of a week. Um, and the, um, I want to thank the folks at the, uh, at Head Start TNTA who are doing two of them, one on dual language and one on um, outdoor ed. We have been uh, encouraged uh, to do more outdoor work with our kids. And so this might be a good opportunity to do one of those. We have a great class. Um, uh, the folks at the ESD in Yakima connected me with um, a mental health specialist there who's doing one around trauma um, and several others. For those of you who are looking for infant toddler, um, we um, we just completed our birth to three institute. Hey, Katie. So, yes. Katie, is there a way maybe you could try it without video because it's you're, it's very glitchy and you're very garbled. Oh yes, I will do okay. that. Because we're not catching everything. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so, um, so, so, um, so yes, so Summer Institute and for those of you who are looking for infant and toddler, um, we just completed our Birth to Three Institute so that, uh, so we weren't going to prioritize that, and then we were going to do something that was really geared towards the um, the uh, early ECAP folks who are still in the process of getting their contracts, um, and the timing just was a little off for planning. But we are working with DCYF to um, to do a a birth to three sort of. Um, uh, starting up a program type thing um, uh, next month, I think. Um, so we are working out um, what that will look like. That'll be separate from the Summer Institute, but there will probably be some cost involved depending on what kind of trainers we get for that and what kind of um, technology we and, and support we have on the WASA side. But um, so that's coming. Um, and the other big thing I wanted to mention is um, that we are partnering with uh, DCYF and their uh, research partners at the University of Washington and Education Northwest um, to do a parent survey. We did a parent survey earlier this year and we have a new one. It just came out um, just in the last couple of days. 
So I want to, um, uh, that's um, in the Wasa Monday email, and I want to encourage you folks to share it, to, to fill it out if you are a parent. If you know parents, share it with other parents. And um, uh, because this is really um, designed to guide our, um, our WASA work here, but also DCYF and make sure that the, um, that the things that we do policy-wise and advocacy-wise are actually based on what parents need and want and have experienced. Um, rather than what we think that they need and want in experience. So I encourage folks, and this is not just for ECAP or Head Start. Um, this is for uh, parents in all um, settings or no settings. We are really just looking to figure out what we need to do to better support parents um, as we move through this COVID-19 thing. It is available right now in English and Spanish. Um, and uh, DCYF is translating into other languages. And so it's the same link for all of the languages. There's just a little box where you select your language. And um, as those new languages get added, they will be added to the survey. Um, and so you'll get this, this will be sort of a perennial in the Wasson Monday email next next week and the week after as these new translations get added so that um, so that we can make sure that you know that um, you can share with uh, your monolingual or um, or people who prefer other languages. Um, any questions about that? All right, a uh, couple other things. Um, those of you who are directors on this call know this, but um, for everybody else, you know, one of the main topics um, that was coming up in the meetups over the last few weeks was around eligibility for ECAP. Um, and uh, Nicole Lohr is on the call. Nicole, do you want to talk a little bit about the guidance that DCYF has provided um, uh, as of Friday, I think? Yeah, absolutely, Katie. Um, <clears throat> can everyone hear me okay? I see some heads nodding. Awesome. So um, we did send out some an, an additional Q&A um, from, and it would have come from Karen, um, if you haven't seen it yet. And the, the four updates that we have are under general topics under modified services. So search for the orange colored uh, uh, questions. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions in there, but the newer ones are, um, are orange colored. So um, after a lot of you know, conversation with directors um, and a lot of questions from the field, um, we wanted to um, you know, put out some guidance around how we were going to, you know, some of the bigger questions that people had around eligibility for ECAP for next year. So uh, the first two are really around um, income and counting income. And the first one is the, um, do we count the federal stimulus checks as income? Um, when enrolling families for this next school year, and the answer is no, we don't count those. Um, that's, in a, that's in alignment with Head Start. The second piece is, do we count the um, unemployment received due to COVID from the CARES Act as income? Um, and the answer to that is also no, um, and that is also aligned with Head Start. And so, um, really, the intention there is to give more stability to families, um, you know, experiencing crisis or, you know, further crisis um, because of COVID-19. Um, along with that, you know, there's, um, and you'll see this language in the, um, in the Q&A, but it creates additional flexibility for families to potentially become eligible for ECAP. Um, and we know that this is a special circumstance and we just encourage ECAP contractor staff to continue to use their best judgment and build in processes that prioritize, you know, continue to prioritize families for, for this from opportunity. Um, and also those disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, and so, you know, we just encourage people to really um, think about that and to kind of coach that in your eligibility enrollment staff. And we will continue to message this this Wednesday with our directors on contractor calls and other avenues, um, you know, as people continue to have questions about it. The other two clarifications are around working day eligibility. 
Um, so the, one of the questions was, do we need, you know, every year um, we require people to um, re-verify families eligibility for working day because we want to make sure those slots are used um, in the best way. Um, for families that really need them. And for this year, because of the special circumstance, we are saying that, um, you know, for families that have temporarily lost their jobs due to COVID, we, we don't want you to re-verify um, their eligibility right now because they would probably not um, have a working day slot available <laughs> when they need it um, in another couple of weeks or a month, um, month or two when their um, employment opens again and they're going back to work. So. Um, we're suspending that temporarily just for this school year for people who have temporarily lost their jobs. Um, and then the other question that we had about new families, enrolling new families is, um, you know, can we enroll families in working day slots if they anticipate they'll be going back to work in July, August, or September? Um, so this is for new families. And we said, yes, you can use anticipated work hours. Um, as you know, the state advances through these phases of recovery and we know people will be going back to work. The same caveat does apply though, you know, that while this may open up additional flexibility for, um, for families to qualify for working day ECAP, um, we want to make sure that ECAP contractor staff are just using their best judgment about um, how to utilize those slots that they have um, and still prioritize the working families that, that really need it. So, we, um, we definitely trust that, um, that ECAP contractors and their staff will be, you know, making those decisions that will um, help, you know, the prioritized families get in and um, we'll be there to support you and coach you through this if you have any questions. So those are the major updates for eligibility right now. Thank you, Nicole. Um, one of the things that we have been hearing as well is, um, uh, uh, that this is um, great for ECAP, and I want to really, really thank the ECAP staff um, and team for going to bat for ECAP providers on this so that we can align with Head Start and really identify those um, families who are unemployed and need continued services. Um, really, really appreciate that. Um, at the same time, I believe that many of you may be inter uh, experiencing um, a similar scenario on your Working Connections kids. Um, so if you are in Head Start and have a working day model um, <clears throat> with parents who are um, re-upping their childcare subsidy, um, many of them are getting kicked off or they're getting hit with super high co-pays um, because of the COVID bonus, uh, stimulus, and unemployment. Um, and uh, so far, um, our advocacy has not uh, borne any fruit whatsoever with the folks in the um, Born Connections folks. They've sent us some RTWs. And so it's nice that Claire is on this call, um, Senator Wilson, um, because this may be something that we may need to um, address in statute um, because they are telling us that they must count the COVID bonus um, uh, as part of income. Oh, geez. geez. Oh, gosh. I, I don't know what my problem is with the, um, with the audio. Can people understand me? Can people hear me? Uh, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. You're kind of floating in and out okay. or fluttering in your voice, I guess. All right. So give me two minutes, guys, and I'm going to try to call in on my, um, on my phone here. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Is that better? Yes. 
Okay, good. Um, so what I was saying, um, in addition to me thanking uh, DCYF ECAP team profusely for their work is that um, Working Connections is counting the unemployment and the bonus, even though they are providing some leeway if you are unemployed to re-up your, um, your eligibility, they're counting that COVID bonus and so people are getting knocked out of eligibility or they're having to pay very high co-pays. Yeah. Um, so we, um, so yes, Claire, this may be something that we may need to um, come to you guys in a special session about. We're trying to work through whether this is something that can be addressed um, so, uh, or that DC yeah. is willing to address an emergency rule or anything like that. So this is something that you may have heard also from the from SEIU and other child care providers about as well. So I already have been working on that in our recovery group with our, um, we have a recovery groups in the Senate and I'm on sustaining people in the system. And so one of the issues we've been talking about is exactly that as well as overtime hours and other issues that have been impacted um, because of COVID-19. So um, we are collecting those things and trying to figure out which of those things, just as you say, are issues that can be waivers or changes within um, and which of those things might need to take legislative action. And it's kind of where the sphere of influence is and, and kind of who, um, how to move that forward. So, um, and I don't have my paper in front of me, um, but there are a number of things just as you're talking about that have impacted um, individuals' uh, ability to continue to get service and support. And um, so very much on the radar. And um, if there is anything in particular you wanna send as far as an email about don't forget these pieces, I would be happy to um, get that from you so my brain doesn't have to remember it. But I think everything that was mentioned along with other um, issues we've heard from um, workers, essential workers has been um, thought about as we think about what it means to support folks as we move forward. So um, yeah, very much a concern about eligibility issues. Um, it's gonna take a while for people to recover because just because they have $1,200 or $600 certainly doesn't boost them into another income bracket that is going to uh, cause anyone to believe they're gonna take advantage of a system. So, oh my goodness gracious. So yes. So I um, thank you so much, Senator. And I guess I would open that up to folks um, apart from uh, what they what, what we've talked about are there other issues related to eligibility for child care or for other things that we need to make sure are on um, the senator's agenda <clears throat> all right um then if we will uh, if if anybody has anything you can send it my way and we will forward it um to claire and to representative sen um we want to make sure that we there's a lot of uh lessons learned with the way that everything is shaking out and we want to make sure that we get rid of as many barriers as possible um okay so um the next thing i wanted to mention is um, the governor's GEARS money. Um, this was part of the Federal CARES Act. Part of it is G-E-E-R-S money. Um, this money is um, sort of it, this education fund, essentially, that they can use for, um, they can use it for uh, early learning, for K-12, for um uh higher ed um we have asked them to use it for ecap um in part not entirely this is about 58 million dollars um and um the governor's office um asked the department of children youth and families to come up with some um, proposals around um summer family support for ecap families um 
I think that they are particularly concerned about um, um, all of these families in crisis, um, just not having any anyone checking in and supporting and connecting them to resources um, after mid-June or earlier. So um, I know that many of you came up with cost estimates, and I think everyone who um, who replies when DCYF comes uh, comes to you for an emergency uh, cost estimate, <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, so we should be hearing something about that from the governor's office, what they put, what they decided to put into their final um, proposal uh, sometime, I'm hoping this week. It seems like it's been way overdue for weeks. So, um, so any questions about that? Or any additions from Nicole or Carrie? And we don't know whether they will include that, um, but one of the one of the reasons why we um, we initially went to the governor's office for use of those dollars for um, center based ECAP for the summer to align with what Head Starts were trying to do, um, I, and I that proposal did not get as much traction as our sort of. Uh, alter alternative proposal of, of really supporting the family support. Um, so, uh, and we don't know if any of that will go into the final version, um, but one thing I will say is that we are going to be um, fighting a, a seriously uphill battle with the um, budget. Um, they are looking at billions of dollars of deficit. Um, ECAP is a cuttable program, um, and um, I think it would serve us well to be able to get um, to be able to bring um, um, the the very essential work that ECAP programs are doing to light as part of this project. It will support our families. Um, and it will put us in a better position moving forward, um, as we have already heard a question from legislative staff about um, how do we make family support cheaper um, and whether there's a way to, uh, to, to reduce that. So um, uh, we think that that's one of the critical parts of, um, of ECAP, and we think it's one of the reasons why we get such great results from um, from ECAP and it makes us crazy when we hear these things from um, and it's from our allies that we're here. From legislative staff or from Yes, from legislative staff. staff Claire. I can tell you later. We'll chat. Thank you. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> yeah. So any questions about summer ECAP family support version? ECAP in, has has had to go, or the DCYF has had to go through a process of um, cutting their budget in a proposal by 15%. Um, we don't have the exact details about what that looks like for ECAP, um, but I would hazard a guess um, that we can probably um, kiss our our complex needs fund goodbye um, and uh, we will be lucky if they don't cut um, slots and things like that this is a proposal only the governor gets to decide what to do in terms of their budget application uh, or their budget proposal for the special session and what might happen after July 1st um, but I I know that we sent out a um, messaging document a couple weeks ago and asked you folks to meet with all of your legislators and talk to them about the work that you're doing and how um, your families are faring um, during this crisis. Um, and if you haven't done that already, you should be doing that this week. <laughs> Um, we will send a, um, a revised version of the messaging document out to everybody on this call um, and all the directors so that um, uh, that reinforces the extreme importance of doing this. Joel and I have been doing these calls. We've been doing them in, con in concert with people um, 
from the district. Um, so um, this morning, for example, we did one with Representative Sullivan with um, somebody from Puget Sound DSD and from Children's Home Society. We did a couple um, with representatives from Spokane with the um, uh, with the community colleges program and one of the other ones. Um, so uh, we are happy to facilitate that in any way if you um, need help. But um, the important thing is do it. <laughs> There is not an ask. This is not lobbying. This is um, this this is just really important that they know that you're still working. Nicole, do you have something? Yeah, I just want to add to to the to the budget discussion to Katie that this Wednesday on the ECAP directors check in for ECAP directors on this call. Um, Kelly and Karen will be joining us, or Kelly will be joining us to talk about the DCYF budget activities too. Um, and Karen shared that in her email on Friday. So, just a heads up that we'll have a, we'll having we'll be having more discussion about it on Wednesday. Awesome. And Nicole, isn't there a webinar too from DCYF? Yeah, I think there is a DCYF budget webinar that is overarching for the entire agency. Um, and I don't know that it goes into too much detail, but um, it was recorded. And um, if you, I think it's probably available on the website or close to being available on the website, but I think it happened last, last week or the week before during the ECAP director's call. And so some of you came to the ECAP director's call and some um, went to that potentially, but yeah, I believe there was an overarching BCYF budget uh, webinar. Yeah. <clears throat> um, all right. Um, I, uh, let me see what else is on my list. Federal, we're still waiting. The um, federal advocacy um, one, so one of the things I will say about the overall financial position that we're in here in the state is that um, what we're hearing from legislators and what we're hearing from advocates is um, we really, really, really need a federal bailout. Um, it's not just that, <clears throat> it's not just that, um, you know, early learning and, um, and child care and, and ECAP are in trouble. It's that the entire apparatus and local government um, taxing issues are a complete disaster. Um, the Congress has, um, they have a bill that would provide another kind of stimulus and support for local government. The, the version that passed the House um, is super weak on early learning. Um, so there's a lot of effort, um, uh, there's a lot of effort on the Senate side to advocate for much larger packages to save, um, early learning programs. And, um, uh, but there's a certain amount of intransigence on the part of some legislators out there and, um, they may not even get to this for a couple of months. And so we are in this very unpleasant limbo where we're looking at massive deficits and no possibility of, um, any additional funds in the near future. So if you have friends in, in, uh, red or purple states or any other states, um, they should be contacting their members of Congress to talk to them about the importance of a major federal stimulus package to, that goes to states to be able to support all of those state programs that um, now have no money. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, all right, any question about that? Um, hello, this is Nola. Hello, this is Nola Hunter. Hi. I call it your learning programs. Is Jennifer there? Yep. Jennifer? Oh, I think, <laughs> I think Alejandro is, <laughs> Alejandro's making calls. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, I think that's all I have. I want to, I want to mention that um, all of the upheaval around um, the protests around police violence um, I think that 
Um, I wonder whether there is anybody on this call who might be, um, one of the things that um, was brought to me by um, one of the family support folks was how do we support families who are really struggling? Most of the families that we serve are families of, of color. And I know from all of my um, colleagues, I hear about the sadness and upset. Um, uh, justifiable that all of these things are happening. Um, and so I'm kind of looking, um, I'm looking for some sort of, uh, um, some, someone to do some sort of, um, uh, webinar or a conversation group, um, that would be available to everyone this week or next week around, um, how to support families, um, during this um, uh, racial upheaval, I guess I would say. So, and I'm trying to choose my words. I, I am not an expert here and I want, I don't want to offend anyone, but if anybody has any expertise or any suggestions um, for people who we can hire, um, please let me know. So Katie, um, this is Tatiana. Yes. Um, I'm very glad you bring, bring this issue up because it's something that we need to talk about it. And um, we posted some books in our website uh, for our preschool about talking about race for, with children. So um, maybe we can send you that and you can share with everybody. It's like about 30 books for um, kids to talk about it. But I think I have a couple ideas of people that they can do a webinar. And uh, maybe Marisela agree with me, with me. Maybe we can bring Tisha Clark. She's a parent and she's working for the um, roadmap as a parent engagement, she's a person of color. Um, and we have another person, uh, Robin Higa, she would be a wonderful speaker too, and also as well, a person of color. Um, and I think both can do a great job. Uh, it's just matter of see their availability on time. Great, thank you, Fatima. I'll reach out to you um, later. And um, the list of um, books for kids, I actually included that in the WASA Monday email. So um, that's been one of the things that has been shared around on Facebook. And so I tried to gather together a few of those resources um, for, for today's email. Um, all right. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but I think that that's all I have. I guess I'm interested in hearing from you guys what, um, what's on the top of your mind and um, what we can help you with. And what, what Nicole and Carrie, in, and Carrie need to hear. <laughs> So, Katie, this is Susan. How are you? Good. I, I want to know whether you have a sense of the timing of some of the budget information, or maybe that's more of a question for Senator Wilson. Is it going to be like a swift? By the time we start July 1, we'll know what the situation is, or is it going to be like this cut here, and then three months later, we get another cut? Or And so it would be really helpful to kind of get a sense, just so we can start to think about our planning efforts. because. Um, we're sort of planning for massive cuts in some way, shape, or form. We're just not sure how deep or how wide to go. It's, it's been a very interesting conversation because in many circles, the conversation isn't about cuts and the conversation isn't about wanting to go in and slash. Um, although we know we're gonna need to be in a situation where we have to be very leery about, you know, what is and how we move forward. Um, you know, we have a um, June 17th is when the next uh, revenue forecast is due out. And there was some conversation initially about June being a special session. However, there were um, other conversations around why would you do a special session before you actually had the information from the newest revenue forecast. Um, unfortunately, I think what we'll see is we're going to have a greater um, issues uh, with this newest revenue forecast than we even have um, projected. Um, and so the last conversation, just to be really honest, is um, potentially, you know, June it looks like it's just not, it's too close. There's no way we can get things put together. So the last conversation was 
um, August, September, or November for special session. Um, and so um, the question is for many, um, why do we need to go back? And there's no reason to go back unless there's work to be done. Um, and so right now, at least from leadership and from um, the caucus that I sit in, um, there's no plan in place, at least that's a public plan that is, says we'll be back um, anytime sooner than the end of summer. Um, that could change, but, um, and then there's, I just have to say many conversations around revenue and around, um, which is a very different thing than I experienced the last two sessions. So people understanding that again, we've always known, you know, how bizarre our tax structure is, but um, clearly um, knowing we have got to um, do something about that. So um, many different conversations that from people I hadn't necessarily heard those conversations from before. So, and that's only from my caucus and my own um, work over this last few months since COVID started. So I don't know if that answers anything, Susan. Yeah, Nothing yeah. landed. But the other thing is we can't do anything until we also legally know how we could actually gather and vote because that, you know, clearly we have to do that from the floor right now. So that's also been part of the work since March is, you know, how would, um, how would one gather? Um, and uh, how do you do that remotely? And how do you do that legally and all those kinds of things? So that's thanks, what I know. Thanks, Senator Wilson. I do then have one follow-up question. I mean, it would be great if you could keep us informed about how big that federal bailout will need to be to really help us. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think we don't really have a good sense. Um, and so we can advocate at different levels, I think, of government yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of helpful from a revenue generation standpoint. But again, it would also be helpful to know what it is we're also advocating on the revenue generation side. Uh, and I'll just say, you know, we've heard some things around, you've heard capital gains, we've heard REIT, we've heard, uh, we have a number of millionaires in our state who have said they're willing to uh, pay more and pay their fair share. And so, um, and we did a, a bit of work last session and uh, Senator Lovelett had a piece of legislation around um, some beginnings of uh, ways to look at um, flipping our system. And so they actively are engaged in that. I'm also engaged with John Burbank around, you know, the whole issue of the career, what was the career and wage ladder and how it is that we're um, potentially having what I would say some uh, targeted and um, focused dollars to support uh, early care and education across our state um, so that we don't just generate money, but we actually um, say here's where the money is going to go and the dedicated buckets of dollars. So that's the work I've been working on and the conversations I've been having and in every room it's not just how do we how do we generate the revenue but here's who needs that revenue that's generated and for what. And I'll continue yeah, Claire, to be updated. Claire, I think the other piece of that is um, that we've had a lot of conversations about is child is um, Health care for early learning professionals? Uh, that's part of the, uh, yes. Oh my goodness, that's part of the conversation. I'll just say that right now too in recovery. And I just need to tell you, and I'm just going to name him so you could say thank you. Um, Senator Conway, um, Steve Conway from down in Pierce County 27, in my recovery group, his whole focus is number one, how to care for and provide health care for folks who have lost it during COVID-19, but also he has now become your greatest supporter of the need for care. Oh my gosh. So, um, and he understands clearly what that means and what that looks like. Also um, hazard pay and, and such and testing, that's all been part of the conversation because you all are first line workers doing jobs and as we go back in, we need to know you're safe, but families need to know their children will be safe as well. So um, child care has become quite the hot topic and it's child care in the broadest sense when I say that. So early care and education um, for all children inclusive of K-12. 
So Nicole or Claire, I'm not sure who is the best person to answer this, but from a practical sort of planning standpoint, if I am an ECAP program, um, it, what does this look like in terms of my contract? Am I going to get a contract and know that I'm going to get that amount for the whole year? Or can the legislature come in mid-year and say, well, for the rest of the year, you're going to get less? What, is that, what does that look like? Goal, are you on there? Yeah, that's um, it's a difficult question, Katie. I know there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty that people are feeling and a lot of fear around, you know, things like that and the potential of, of cuts. And, you know, we haven't really been in a situation like this before. Um, and so I think that that's a great question to ask you know, on the Wednesday call, I don't know that I necessarily have enough information to, to answer that. <laughs> but I know I'll have the, the, um, the larger, you know, um, group of folks to, um, to help kind of answer that on this Wednesday call. So um, I would just say, you know, we, I'm not sure that we know at this point, but um, maybe Kelly and Karen and even Kelsey, who, uh, you know, does a lot of our contract stuff will be able to help answer that question on Wednesday. You know, the, the, the biggest issue, obviously, is we have only certain pots of money that are dedicated, like, you know, basic ed is protected and those dollars can't be taken out. Um, but I also have to say that um, given the situation and given the global nature of this and the concern around care of kids, because none of our families or our parents can go back to work unless their children are cared for, um, I think that there would be less likely that we would decimate a system that was supporting those children and families than perhaps in other times. So my hope is that across the board, um, you know, we are look at this as we always have as the best intervention and prevention we could ever do. Um, and at the same time, um, the conversation with business and everyone else has been if we do not have this very, if we don't have this structure in place, families cannot go back to work. They, they can't, there is no place for those. And I'll tell you, Boeing had conversations with Boeing. They can't get folks to go back to work in Everett because they can't find school age care. So people need, you know, there's a greater understanding and I hope it, it, it doesn't turn into action that people don't turn on what they know um, when they go back and then forget about the people they've been talking to and the situations that they've been hearing. You know, I'll stand up and speak out, you know me, and I know there's a, many others that will as well, but the other piece is we decimated systems how many years ago during when we had the last recession and we are, um, we are now dealing with the outcome of that. And so there's been a lot of conversation around we cannot do that again. Um, and I hope that um, we stay true to that and uh, value the, the people that live in our state. All right, so Stacy says they talked to Representative Dent last week and he really heard them and connected the need for early care and businesses opening. He mentioned the Boeing situation as well. All right, other, uh, other thoughts and issues that are coming up out there? Katie, this is Cynthia, and um, I can give an update to what we shared um, on a previous call about our plans to open Migrant Seasonal Head Start. We were yes. really excited. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, you know, we had, we did go through a very comprehensive, intensive process of planning and preparation, and we've been co uh, um, coordinating with other early learning programs in our region to try to learn from each other and sort of stay um, kind of in the same time frame in terms of reopening. And we learned right before we were going to start serving children, we learned that um, other, another program, it's, it, they, they had reopened and they had to close uh, very quickly uh, several of their sites due to um, positive staff. Um, so 
and you probably all have heard in Yakima County, we're really, um, we have a high rate of positive um, infection in our county. So just several factors we had to weigh in and we had to, we had to delay our opening. So I think that's just still going to be one of the realities that um, we're all going to face as we start to reopen is that it's hard to really control no matter what you put in for preventive practices. It's really hard to control and avoid having any um, positive COVID cases in staff um, or children even. And we just felt the risk was too high. So we decided not to open. I think it was a couple of weeks ago we were planning to do that. So we're, we are doing remote services, um, but going to reassess our the, the uh, readiness of our county in another couple of weeks. Thanks, and Cynthia. Lynn, and Lynn might have more details to share too. Appreciate that. And, and that actually speaks to uh, one of the things in the parent survey. I know that we're all, we've all been, um, you know, building this plane while, while we've been flying it um, in terms of remote services and figuring out what works and what doesn't work and how we can better support families. Um, among the questions on the parent survey is what kind of um, what kind of services are people receiving from their early learning program and what's working and what's not working? Um, because I think you're right. You have you know you guys have multiple iterations of having of opening and then having to close. And I would not be surprised if that doesn't happen pop up all over the state as we all go back to work. So we're really going to need to think about how to be flexible and continue to provide remote services when we have to send kiddos home and um, what is working and what's not working. And so um, that's one of the things we're really worried about for the fall. All right, other thoughts? I'll just add a little bit more. For some reason, Cynthia's name is showing up as me. So I don't know. Anyways, I thought that was interesting. And to hear myself talking. <laughs> um, the other thing is, is like you're saying, Katie, is that because we've had plans, um, we are working on multiple different versions because like everybody is saying, so just even making sure that staff has all the technology. So just even be thinking about that and then family technology um, and then being able to constantly be able to change. If you're in a center base and all of a sudden you do have an outbreak, all of a sudden you're in a home-based model. So just being really flexible and coming up with those different ideas. We're even starting to look into, because we we're going to do summer programming. Um, Head Start had offered that summer and we're just going to kind of wait for that, but even looking into other curriculums that are um, more appropriate for early learning um, and a home based type of environment. So that we're just, we're doing a lot of different things. So hopefully we can continue to update you guys on what's working and what's not working. That's great. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and this actually came up on our call today with Representative um, Sullivan, he had a lot of questions about technology, both for parents and for staff and what that was looking like. And we told him it was a pretty big struggle. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this Dallas is Jackie. Go for it. Jackie. Oh, okay. This is Jackie Haid, and I'm on the Port Gamble Slalom Reservation. And our um, approach as an organization is that all of us staff, as we are coming back and we are reopening, we're in our phase one and a half because early learning has to open up prior to the other staff going back because we offer the services where the youngest children can go. So right now I have about 15 staff with 12 children and we're continuing virtual and in our surveying of families, about 20%, that's on an average across the nine classrooms that we have, uh, are choosing only to do virtual for the rest of the school year for their children. So, and that's, those are families that are at home with their children, not needing um, to work. Um, and our phasing goes through um, a slow process of uh, hopefully 100% of services back and running by July 8. Um, we're being COVID-19 tested every two weeks as a staff. Uh, we are not testing uh, children as they enter, but we're going through a vigorous health screening 
not letting anyone else enter into our uh, building. But all of the teachers are maintaining that virtual connection. So we're in this flurry of, whoa, <laughs> virtual continues for even for us in the center, we have to practice um, we're finding out what it's like to um, be masked, be in a shield, uh, be keeping six feet physical distance between us as uh, adults, knowing that you can't do that with children, and then working with staff to feeling this is how we have to respond to children. It's more than I can imagine. <laughs> it's... Um, and the school age, we have long lists of families that need school age. Uh, our school ends 619, so I have staff that are saying, I just can't come back because I have three to four days of classes for my elementary or middle school kids. So um, the, the, there's just, um, I, the normal is just not here. It's just so layered with all sorts of other things to support families, uh, family, the families that are your staff too. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. yeah thanks, Jackie. Uh, Ethna is asking if any of the children are wearing masks. No, so currently we have, um, <clears throat> only our zero to five and we will not mask a zero to five as our school age comes back. Um, we're considering having them. Our families are telling us that the school age kids, some of them are used to wearing masks because they're going out more into public with their adults in the family. Uh, but no kids under five, five and under are wearing masks. The only time per policy is, and we had to create a sick room, um, <clears throat> is that we will uh, mask a child two years and up if they um, have any symptoms and we have to um, have them removed from classroom and adults stay with them. And this goes for the adults here too, that we have to remove them really quickly isolate and uh, have someone come and meet us at the door to pick them up but we have to have that room uh, we had to give up a therapy room in our center because we uh, normally we don't have a sick room or a nurse's station thanks the things you have to think about these days um, all right any other thoughts before we close up All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, keep a lookout for the um, for the email about meeting with your legislators, and um, have a great week. Thank Bye. you.